So welcome everyone to this first lecture of the week that's going to be recorded because I am chairing a federal committee during the whole week. Uh, first off, before starting, remember that I'm available on Teams. If you have any question, there's a channel to ask Q&A about the course and we can interact through this during the week if you have questions about the, um, uh, the contents of the material. The first lecture, as well as the second, will be dedicated to testing because so far we've seen development lifecycle processes, we've seen a little bit of design decisions and all the principles, solid grasp and all of this, but we really don't have any confidence of on what we're doing. So we're writing code, we're trying to apply good design, fine, but this is doing the product the right way. And we've never really addressed what is about doing the right product, how our product is actually um, valid with respect to specification. So that's how tests can help us actually. And that will be the, the first lecture really about like big principles of software testing. Why are we testing? What is a test? Next lecture will be a little bit more like technical about what should we test when we are writing something. And this week tutorial is really about putting this into motion. So it's about identifying which tests to write and also like starting from a quick and small example. And then the last half of the tutorial will be working with your group into thinking what in your assignment is uh, necessary to test and how you can do that. So without further ado, this works. Yep. Uh, as usual, three parts. First, testing, what and why. Then we'll go into unit testing, which is the only kind of testing we're going to um, cover together in 2AA4. And then we'll look at writing good unit tests. So first point, um, why do we test? And the role of software development, the role of tests inside software development, because, well, we're software developers, so we're the best in the world, and we don't test because, well, our code is perfect. So why should we bother testing? Because we're so good that we're always writing code that is perfect. Testing, if we take a step back and look at the um, big life cycle uh, thingy that we've seen together uh, last week, it's part of what we call verification and validation. So the whole point is that this is related to software quality, but the whole idea is like we want to validate and we want to verify. It's part of like the dimension of quality we're covering. So the validation, it's related to the conformance to specification. It's really, am I right? Am I building the right product? Am I delivering the right thing? And by applying validation techniques, we're trying to find defaults. Okay, it's like when you have a physical product and there's something that doesn't work like physically, well, this is something that we can identify immediately. Um, that often implies humans because, well, we need customers, we need end user representative, we need to validate that this is going, this is cool. And the correctness is actually a verification um, situation where we want to be sure that our, like answer the question, are we building the product correctly? And this is where we can use testing to identify errors. There's a different way of doing this, static approaches, and we'll see on the next slide, dynamic approaches. The idea of static approaches, if you remember the lecture on code quality that we had uh, previously, it's abstract interpretation, rule-based system. It's really like, we look at the source code, we're not executing anything. We're just look at the source code and based on the source code, we're basically just trying to find defects or default that can be found without executing. So that has a main advantage, which is I don't have to execute the code. I don't even have to know how the code is executed. I can just like look at the source code and find this. I can do it automatically with a tool, or I can actually read the code and do this. Main issue is that, well, it's kind of like impossible to do it at scale, uh, except on some very specific property. And you can only detect like classical anomalies, like, oh, the code is not written the right way, or you've, you've, you've got an if, but you forgot an else, those kind of things. So that's not really, that's helpful, but that's in a way pretty limited. But if you have an answer using this, the answer is kind of like absolute. If we move to dynamic approaches, which is what we're going to do with testing, that's really the essence of testing, is that we'll not look at the source code. 
tool school is a black box. Like we don't know what's happening there. Uh, what we know is that we're gonna run the software, execute it, and we're gonna check what's happening. So it's not that like a static approach where we would be theoretically covering each and every possible um, execution path. It's really like, we're just executing something and we check that for this very specific execution, the answer is the answer I was expecting. Immediate pros, uh, that's basically what's gonna happen at runtime. Because well, at runtime, we execute the software and it produces an answer to a given question. So testing this way, it's basically just doing at scale several execution and verifying that the answer is correct. And because it's automation, uh, it's pretty easy to do because we're going to use code to test our code. So our tests are just basically programs that will execute our program and check the answer. The immediate cons is that we're just working on particular examples. So it doesn't mean that because all of our tests are passing, in, in the industry, you will hear like all our tests are green because a, a failing test is usually represented in red. So a green test is a, a test that passed. So it doesn't mean that all because all our tests are green, uh, that there's no bug in our system. What it means is that it's only in what we've tried to execute, the execution path we've checked, then this is correct for those cases. So it's not because your tests are here that your program doesn't contain error. And that's actually the kind of mindset you need to have when you try to test. Um, testing is really the process of executing a program with the intent of finding errors. So when you're writing tests, you need to be tough with yourself, or actually what is better is to test the code written by your teammates and you need to shake it up. You need to be like, okay, I'm, tr I'm trying to break it. What, what can I do to try to break your code? And then that becomes your test cases. And the more adversarial you are when you're writing your test, the better it is for your program. Because, well, you, you really hit the stuff hard. And, well, it stood up. So that's pretty fine. Testing can actually happen at very different levels. Uh, that's what we call the testing pyramid, because it's basically, a again, a trade-off between um, the speed and the cost. So what we can do if we look at this part, they're basically the same thing. It's just like this one is more about integration and um, rapidity, and this one is, again, um, like speed, but also dollars. If you test the user interface, which is the very last stuff you're going to expose to your uh, customer, then writing those tests are super, super expensive. And you will actually cover this in the human computer interaction course level four. And you'll see that that requires double blind stuff, bringing people, doing maybe OS with a result of OS approaches that you'll see in that course. It's pretty, pretty complex. The business layer in the middle, this is more the uh, large scale software design course that you will have uh, still level four. And this is kind of the idea of more integration. Like I have several systems that are working together and cooperating. What we're going to work on uh, into AA4, it's really the notion of unit test. Why? Because we focus on the notion of module MIS, ADT, interfaces. So really about those encapsulated small concepts. And we really want to look at those and be like, OK, I want to test those. I want to know that my implementation is OK. And actually, so I said, like, this is more the HCI course. This is more the large scale design course. This is more our course to AA4. But you will have, as part of the BNG, a full software engineering course um, which is 3F03, which is really dedicated to testing like in a comprehensive way. So you will see way more different kinds of tests and you will see like way much more than what we're gonna cover in this course because this is just really an introduction so that you know it exists and you know how it works. Basically, when, I, when I'm talking to you about the notion of unit tests, I have my small module, I have my maze, I have my map, I have my whatever. Um, when you're thinking of tests, you're not really thinking of tests. If you think you're testing your code, what you're doing is actually 
trying it. You're basically writing some main functions uh, and you're then executing and you're checking that it's getting an answer. But this is like very, very manual. And in that case, if I was, if I was like trying to um, test my car, what you have on the screen right now is not a test. It's a trial at best, meaning that I want to know if my car is fire resistant. I pour some gas on top of it. I just throw a match. And well, apparently it's not. But it's not because the, this particular car is in fire that this is a real test. It's like I tried something and apparently it didn't work. So that's basically the metaphor for when I'm writing some stuff in my main function and I'm just like checking that, oh, it looks like it works. Okay, but this is very, very manual and tedious process. If I keep the car metaphor, the notion of test is more like the end cap situation. So I'm taking my car, that's not the same one on the previous one, but you got the, the ID. And I'm going to put this car in a very, very controlled and uh, known context, given distance from the wall, uh, precise position of the mannequin inside, um, adults on the front, kids at the bottom, at the rear, and we're going to measure the distance and we're really going to do something which is reproducible. So if I'm running the same test twice, I will have the exact same result being the distance that the car absorbed when hitting the wall to protect uh, the kids and the people at the front. So this would be a test. Why? Because it's not just like putting a car on fire that we can do that if we have the budget, but that's not the point. It's really getting a context of execution, running it, so taking the car and crashing it against the wall and measuring some properties. I want to check that my uh, passengers are alive after the crash. And to do this, I'm putting the car in a context that I know it's going to be a crash, that I control everything, run the crash and look at the results. So basically, the ingredient for a test, it's a little bit like an MIS. We need to do some engineering. So we need to document what's happening. So to represent our test uh, with a name, like it's a scenario that like, why are we testing this? Uh, we need some data, like we're in a given context. So we need to know that, okay, this is a parameter that I'm receiving. Um, we need the code that's gonna call the unit being a module, being a class, being an implementation of an interface, whatever we want to call a unit. And we need what's called oracles. We need to know what's the expected result. And that's what we called an oracle, okay? So we have the data, we know the code, and we know the expected answer. So with this, we just trace the execution, observe the result, and store those. Say, so, okay, at that time, this result was okay. And if we consider that we're running multiple test scenario, well, we actually obtain a comprehensive report at the end, which is, oh, this is all the scenarios you've checked, and this one's correct, this one's correct, this one is not correct, this one is correct. And so that can help you debug. Interestingly, um, testing, it's like, it's coding actually, because tests are code, but it's a development activity, like specification, analysis, design, implementation, right after in the V cycle, for example, you have the notion of testing. Usually you write your code, you test it, or you can do it the other way around, but that's another uh, debate. And it's part of the effort that you need to put in writing the software. So it needs to be budgeted. You need to have a budget in terms of time, in terms of resource, in terms of people um, to basically do this quality assurance QA um, activity, which is, okay, what should we test? How should we write this? Write the stuff, run the stuff, and collect the results. I forgot to mention that all the slide with that guy on the top right, uh, uh, this, his name is Professor Philippe Collet from Université Côte d'Azur in France. And it's basically just an adaptation of his course on software testing, which is actually really good as an introduction. So the second point, um, what do we test and how do we test it? Before going into what do we test, we need to know what we can do. 
So we've never tested before. So we're gonna go like before going Jedi Master, we need to go Padawan. So how can we write a test? And why unit testing is really like the entry level of this? Well, the notion of unit test uh, was coined by Beck and Gamma in 1997. And those names, you will hear them again uh, when we go into patterns. Uh, they're really like software engineers that created some foundational pillar of what we're using today, nowadays, when we're developing software. And they actually work the same way we worked in this course. Um, we did something. In their case, that was the notion of test um, in JUnit, like 1997. And actually, then we can abstract those concepts into something which is language independent. You can test in Java the same way that you can test in Smalltalk, the same way you can test in Python, the same way you can test in blah, blah, blah. So they abstracted this into something called XUnit. Test in Java, we're basically using JUnit. There's others, but this is the main one. And this is like the mainstream de facto standards for testing in Java. Um, but in small talks, that would be S unit. And so all those abstractions, it's really defined as X unit. And what is super interesting is that you'll see after the midterm that we can take a week. So a little bit more than a week, like four hours, four times 50 minutes. And we can create our own unit test framework with all the things we've seen in the course. It's pretty good exercise, say, starting from scratch, we know nothing, and then we're gonna to build together something called Mac unit, which is which will be our implementation of X unit with all the good principle of solid design, assignment of responsibilities and stuff like that to build our own um, test framework. So that being said, for history is history. Um, what we're doing, with unit testing and why we start with this, because we can focus on a unit and the notion of units will depend on your zoom level. The smallest zoom level would be a method that the smallest things I can test is executing a method and running a scenario. So giving some parameters, checking an answer. And I can do this in different way, different parameters. That's basically what we'll see next. And then I can unzoom and be okay, then my unit is not the method anymore in the class. And so I can check that my test for all my methods inside my class cover something which makes sense from the cohesion of the class. And then I can unzoom and say, oh, okay, then my unit is a package. And I can do the very same, checking that all my classes inside my package have a reasonable test. And then I can unzoom and, oh, then now my unit is in my program. And my program is composed of packages that is composed of classes that are composed of methods. You get the point? We're having this kind of like continuum and we're aggregating tests and execution at each and every level. We use them to identify errors. We, again, are not here to demonstrate that the program is correct. You can't, and I emphasize this, you can't demonstrate that your program is correct using tests. Okay, tests are just, I executed it and it produced the expected result. That's fine. That doesn't mean that another execution will also produce a, um, a correct result. So you'd say, okay, but then that's stupid. Why should we do that if that doesn't prove anything? Well, the fact that it doesn't prove anything doesn't actually mean that that doesn't make any sense because good tests are what we call a trip. Okay, it's a trip, it's a destination. We're going somewhere by testing our, pro our project. And what we, what we have is that our test, they will be automatic, they will be thorough, they will be repeatable, they will be independent, and they will be professional. If we have those five properties, well, that helps us gaining confidence. It's automatic, so each time I'm writing on my code, I can run the test and it will go through all the test case and give me a result. It's thorough because, well, as software engineers, we can be sure that we're covering what needs to be covered. It's repeatable. Each time I need to test, I can run it. And because I have a given context, a given expected, expected answer, and I can automate the validation of this, well, I can run it as many times as I want. I will always get the same result. It's independent. <laughs> Sorry. 
it's independent. I can actually run my test uh, for one class and not all the others. So if my software is a million line of code, I can actually just focus on the part I'm working on locally. And then when I'm okay, when everything's fine, I've did my refactor or I've added my new feature, I can run the test at the package level and then I can run the test at the global level. So I can unzoom like this because all my tests are independent from each other. And finally, it's professional because that goes like it's a part of the software development life cycle. I've delivered some code. I'm providing some testing of the code. So I've got like quality control, check. Again, I'm not proving that my code is correct. What I'm saying is that for what I've tested, I have reasonable confidence that what I'm doing is good. If we look at those um, five properties, we have actually three actors working on um, our project. We have the development team on the left-hand side. We have the management team on the right-hand side. And we have JUnits, so XUnit framework that we're going to use to test our Java code. And if we try to attribute responsibilities, because responsibilities is not just method and code, it's something which is more like philosophical, who's in charge of what when developing your project. <laughs> well, JUnits is actually in charge of automation and repeatability. OK, that's really. Because we're using GUnit, we make things repeatable, we make things automatic. You'll see that how it's included in Maven. Each time you Maven package to actually run the test, and this is done totally automatically. The management is in charge of a professionality. Okay, so we're part of a process, we're playing a process, being an agile method, being a V cycle, being a waterfall, being a double V, being a spiral, whatever, but we have a process and QA is part of the process. So testing is part of the process. The team, which is basically you working on your assignments, but more generally contributing to any software engineering development, your responsibility is to be thorough. So you have to think of what you're testing and test it like with the intention of finding errors. Because if you're just like sprinkling some tests to make it shine, well, that's fine. You will have tests. You can actually say, oh, we have written a lot of tests, but they were nice tests. You don't want that. Um, and agents are polite by definition, but you don't want to be polite when you're testing your code. You really want to shake it, hit it, find an errors. And when you're doing this, you want each punch that you're giving to the code to be independent so that you can run them independently and you don't have to run like, 1 million lines of code of testing each time you compile. You can actually zoom on what you mean. And that is very, very important because, well, so far you're working on small assignments. So basically running the test will take maybe a minute max running all your test case. Uh, but when you work at scale, I've worked with software that can take more than two days of computation to run the whole test suite. And you don't want to run two days of compute, two days of execution each time you commit something, each time you do something. So it really needs to be independent so you can decide which tests you're going to re-execute. Let's take an example. That would be your first, uh, not test, but this is just Java class, okay? Um, it's very classical. Each time we talk about X unit or any unit test, it's a money example that comes. So I didn't, I wasn't like too uh, fancy on this one. Just keep the by the book example. Um, so we have the notion of money, and basically a money is an amount in a given currency, okay? So that's what I have. It's private, uh, could actually be final, and but not in that case. And I'm creating a money by giving this is an amount in a given currency. This is 15 euros, this is uh, 20 USDs, this is 45 Canadians. That's pretty simple. And I have access to the amount and have access to the currency. This code, those are getters actually, but they're not using the Java get something or set something convention. This is arguable in a way, but that's just to show you that you're exposing information. It's related to the lecture on encapsulation and information hiding, but it doesn't mean that it needs to be get something or set something. Okay, it's just like you're exposing, oh, I'm exposing the amount and I'm exposing the currency in, um, in the money content. So this is your first test, and that's where things become interesting. How do I know it's a test? Well, we're going to use what's called in Java an annotation. Annotation in Java starts with an at, 
and can be anything like there's several other annotation in, in the language, but JUnit gives you a test. So any method that I'm going to annotate, annotate, annotation is like a sticky note or like a stamp that you put on the method. This is a very regular legit method, but the fact that I put add test, I'm kind of like indicating to JUnit that, hey, by the way, this is not just a regular method. This is a test and you have to take care of it. So JUnit being super kind will actually Look at all the methods that are annotated with test and consider this as test to execute for us. Okay, so each time you want a test to be executed, you basically put an add test on top of your method and GUnit will take care of it. You'll experiment with this in the tutorial with your TA this week. Second point, what we need to load is actually this import here, which is importing assertions. We need to automate the verification. We don't want to go manually and check the results of all the execution. We want to delegate this to JUnit. Because, well, JUnit is the program, so the more the program does, the less we do, and the more we can like play Baldur's Gate or whatever. So what I'm doing here is that I'm basically importing assertion. This, if you're not familiar with import starting in Java, not a big deal. Take it as a dark magic spell, or basically you need this in at the beginning of your test. And this gives you the opportunity to write this kind of code, assert equals something, something. And by giving by, by writing this, what you're doing here is that you're telling JUnit, hey, this value must be equals to this one. You're not doing the verification yourself. You're basically telling JUnit, you're delegating to JUnit the fact that, hey, expected, must be equals to result. How will JUnit do the stuff? You don't know and you don't care because that's the point of object-oriented method and object orientation, object-oriented design. I delegate to someone the complicated things that I don't know how to do. I don't know how to check this. I don't know how to report that this should be, uh, um, I should tell the developer that something is going wrong here. I, I don't know, I don't care. I'm just declaring that Hey, at the end of this method, expectant is supposed to be equals to result. How you do it, not my problem. Okay. This being said, we can now look at and zoom on this method. So it actually contains three parts. The first part is the orange stuff here is what we call the fixture. That's a posh word to say context. That's my controlled environment. For well, this scenario, I'm considering 12 Canadians and 14 Canadians. Then I have my Oracle and assertion. We discussed the assertion, but my Oracle is what I'm expecting. So the result of adding 12 Canadian to 14 Canadian is actually 26 Canadian. So this object expected is my Oracle. This is what I want to obtain, what I should obtain, at the end of the execution of adding 12 to 14. And the last part, which is what we call the experience, is actually coding the code. So this is the only part of the code that is related to my business logic. And it's pretty small. It's one line out of one, two, three, four, five. Okay. So 20% of my test is actually running the code. 80% of my test is putting things in a given context, telling what I'm expecting, and measuring that what I obtained, the result is equal to what I was expecting. Okay? So if you got this, well, basically you have the notion of unit testing. Okay, unit tests can be slightly more complicated and you will see this during the tutorial, but basically this is the idea. So if you've got this from a comprehensive point of view, you got the notion of testing. Each time I'm testing, I'm going to a given context, that's my fixture, that's usually the beginning of the test. I'm declaring what I'm expecting for readability purpose, that's my oracle. I'm running my code, I'm calling my code, that's my experience, and I'm running an assertion. So all tests usually follow more of that syntax, that structure, sorry. Fixture, oracle, experience, assertion. Why should I do that? Well, basically, Writing tests, that's my railroad safety measure when I'm developing. That gives me two things. First thing, that gives me non-regression. 
if I have something that work, I can do whatever the hell I want in my code. As long as my tests still work, it means that I'm quite confident I haven't broken anything. I might have because tests are not a proof, but at least to all the case I'm testing so far, my evolution, my new code is not bringing me back because all the stuff that were working before, the stuff that I was testing, well, they're still working. And that can really accelerate you. That slows you down at the beginning because you have to write the code and you have to write the test. So it's kind of like count double in terms of effort. But remember, software engineering, it's programming integrated over time. It's about maintenance. So sure, it's going to cost a little bit more today, but it's going to save us hours, days, weeks later on. Why? Well, you made a mistake like the mistake we made in the course where we were discussing the different way of uh, comparing. We, I was comparing inside the card, not a good idea. Now I need to compare externally, so I need to refactor. I'm not adding a new feature. I was able to compare, but I need to make it in a different way. So basically, to be sure that my code is ISO functional, that I haven't broken anything, I just do my refactoring and run the test. If all the tests are green, that should be okay. If I broke something, well, my refactoring is wrong. My refactoring is incorrect. And the test will help me doing like knowing this. Second point, there's this line that looks stupid and not used. So broken glass, uh, broken window principle, Boy Scout principle. If I see something weird, I should clean it so I can remove it. Well, that's my job. But if I had no test, I had absolutely no idea what I'm doing. Because maybe that line of code was extremely essential and I just didn't know about it. With the test, well, I'm fine. I can move it, run the test if nothing broke. Again, this is not a proof, but it means that based on the confidence level that we had, we haven't broken anything. So if I assume my test cases and test scenarios are covering enough the software, I have more confidence that I haven't broken anything. And if I'm adding something, adding a new feature, well, have I broken something while adding the feature? Very same, run the test. If everything's green, I have the same level of confidence. That was for the evolution, okay? maintenance over time. Second point, that can give me what you're usually struggling with, which is the definition of don't. When is my feature okay? When should I stop coding because I've done enough and I have the answer I'm looking for? And you're usually renting that because specification is vague and imprecise, it's really hard to know when to stop. Fine. Translate this vague and imprecise uh, specification into test scenario. And then your test scenario, they're automatically executed. So you can take specification, you can transform this into test case, and when all your test cases are green, so they pass, you're good. There is no need to continue putting some effort in the code, basically because you have your scenarios that are OK. And that brings us another side effect, which is pretty good, which is then your code is automatically tested because you use the test as kind of like a way to bridge the gap between this vague and imprecise specification and the code you're writing. Okay, So you get kind of like a spectrum, a continuum. Something interesting is that for some industry, Avinix uh, mainly, but also like automotive, testing can actually cost more than the product because it would be such a big deal if your uh, tests are not OK because you haven't tested the product enough. So it doesn't go through the certification pipeline and you can't sell that aircraft or you can't put that car on the, on the highway that you have to fix it. So you need really to invest on your test. And the thing that is really important is that Validation and verification are actually two different things. And I will say it again and again and again in the context of this lecture, testing is not about proving that your program is error-free. You're not doing that. You're not proving anything. You're exhibiting defects. You're saying, oh, in this case, there was an error. Now they're not. In this scenario, we're fine. But that doesn't mean that your program doesn't contain any bug. We can flip this. Sure, testing doesn't help me to prove that my program doesn't contain any bug. 
but that can help me bug hunting. Because if I found a bug, if someone writes a ticket on the Kanban, writes an issue, sorry, on the Kanban board saying, hey, there's a bug here. Fine, let's take that bug, make the test case. So I obtain the reproducibility of the bug. I know that in this context, the program is supposed to produce an answer and it actually doesn't produce the right one. So I can write my test case, fix a bug, and that gives me two things. First, my definition of DOM, this bug is fixed when the test case is green because, well, that was the context where it wasn't working, now it works. Second point, that increase my test suite by one, and as such, next time I'm gonna run the test, I will have that new test case. So I will have a new part of the program that I wasn't covering because my test suite was not complete. Um, and, at the end of the day, I'm better because now I have one more test that I had before. The last part of this lecture is related to how can we write good unit tests? We've seen how to write a very small unit test that was adding 12 Canadians to 14 Canadians. We've seen why we need to test. We've seen, we've seen kind of like how this is part of the life cycle and how it's actually, okay, taking some time at T0, but helping us on, over the long, like on the long run. That was like Padawan level. How can we go like a little bit more Jedi Knight? Well, it's not that complex. Main ID, feedback loop that we discussed during the life cycle. As developer, I want to know as soon as possible that something is going wrong because if I wait, I will have trouble to find where is my problem because it kind of like going to be buried into tons of modification. So if I modify two lines of code, tests were green, and now tests are red, that might be those two lines of code. If I uh, worked a full week, and now my tests are red, well, what happened during the whole week? I have no idea. So it's really like, I need to be able to code, test, code, test, code, test, which is why JUnit or any other XUnit framework save us like hours because it's automating and doing the repetition for us. We can do also it, we can also do it the other way around, sorry, which would be writing the test. Like when we have a bug, we, we have the bug and we write the test case, it's red, there's a bug, we fix it and now it's green. You can have the same approach for specification. This is called test-driven development. And that would be, I'm taking my specification, making it a test case, it's red, I'm implementing the feature, it's green, I'm cleaning up my code, refactor, rinse and repeat, okay? So the, the point is not like, oh, I need to code and test, code and test, or I need to test and code and test and code. This is like dogma, which doesn't make any sense. The main point here is this is a dual activity. If I'm coding, I'm testing. I can test before, I can test after, but from a software engineering point of view, if I'm coding, I'm testing, and this is non-negotiable. Because this gives me quality insurance and I can run my tests as often as possible. Each time I compile, I can run. Each time you run Maven package, you actually trigger Maven test. Maven test is something that you run just after Maven compile. So the pipeline when you're running Maven is Maven compile. I'm, build, I'm compiling the Java classes. Maven test. I'm executing the test suite. Maven package. I'm taking all the classes and I'm putting it as the jar file. So this is kind of like immediate feedback loop for you. And by doing this, that helps you working on the critical part of your program. You define the interface being an MIS, being a classical interface, like whatever kind of stuff you want to do to define your module. And you can actually describe the semantics that what we use with the, um, in the MIS as uh, like formal uh, math specification, you can actually translate this into test cases and you have your interface, you have the test cases, and this is basically the implementation of your semantics. Finally, if you're debugging with system out print line, well, you're losing a lot of time because you have to check manually that the, the values that is printed is the one you're expecting. So you can actually use a unit test instead that will do it for you. And as I was saying, if you found the bug, just write a test. 
talking about writing a test, tests are code, and code needs to be readable. That's maintainable over time. So the smallest, the minimal assertion that you can do is the assert equal. Okay, I want to check that something is equal to something else. So I can check, for example, that a condition is equal to false. But this is kind of like hard to read. So assertions comes with kind of like a language. I can say, for example, assert false condition, which is immediately readable, like, oh, this should be false. Okay. Same for uh, checking that something is null. Well, if I'm only using assert equals, I should test a condition that condition is null. Then if this is true, I'm okay. Well, this is kind of like super heavy to write. So basically just assert null. That's also something that is uh, given by the language. So basically what I encourage you to do is to uh, use your code completion in your IDE or go to the uh, documentation of JUnit and look at all the assertions you can use because there are tons of them and they're pretty nice to help them. My point, and it's not like a midterm question or whatever, to know by heart all the different assertions, that would be stupid, but just like focus on readability. Okay, the more readable your test case are, the more happy you will be in six months. And again, emphasizing that test they're basically code. Boy Scout, Rock and Window, maintainability, readability, all the things that we discussed with the code, we actually can do it for the tests. Same for the modularity that we'll see, like all those kind of things. So invest in your test, gonna cost you a little bit more at the beginning, but we're okay with that. Because at the beginning, we're often working on small stuff because we're decomposing. So I'm decomposing my stuff into a walking skeleton, so different set of stuff. I can start putting some tests here and there. Like, oh, in my walking skeleton, this is very essential. Bam, test case. And this needs to happen. Bam, test case. And I can actually start bootstrapping my test case, my test suite um, by just incrementing one by one. And I start with one, then two, then 10, then 20, then 100. And that goes pretty, pretty fast as soon as you make it like on the fly. If you do all your assignments and or, or your product and then suddenly you're like, oh crap, there's rubrics uh, for the testing. So we have to test and you're not gonna like it. First, because that will identify problems. Second, because your code might not be testable, you will have trouble to identify independence, which means that your code has design problems because if you can write independent tests, it means that your modules are independent from each other, which is pretty cool because that's a good um, hint that the solid principle and the grasp uh, patterns are implemented because everything is kind of like loosely uh, coupled. So it's really gonna save you time and help you validating your design. So take a step back, think about how you're gonna test your things. This is, for example, how can you make your context more readable, okay? Each time I'm gonna work with my money test, I will have 12 um, uh, francs uh, from Switzerland and 14. And so each time I'm setting up my fixture, I will basically set, hey, I have 12 and 14, uh, and I'm using this to actually instantiate my objects. This is a test, annotated with test, and say like, oh, I'm testing equals, so 12 should not be equals to null, 12 should be equals to 12, 12 should be equals to a new 12, that should be the same, and 12 should not be equals to 14, Chip something. Second test, well, this is the add, so I'm expecting 26, and my result is adding 12 to 14, and I should have that result. And what I can do is before each, which is pretty natural language, okay, but that's actually in Java annotation. I mean, before each test, I will run the setup method. And the setup method, what's happening? Well, put into F12 the new money and put into F14 this new money. Meaning that actually when I'm executing test equals, that was executed before. So my money attribute and this money attributes contain exactly the right uh, value. So I factorized my context into one single fixture that is gonna be executed 
before each test that I've defined. And my money test, that's basically my test suite. In the activity of testing the notion of money, the abstraction of money, I have two tests, one testing the equality and one testing the addition. And I factorize the setup into something which is used, reused actually by the two tests. And this is really the essence, okay? We can, you can write very crappy tests. There will be a nightmare to write and there will be a nightmare to maintain. So really try to be like, reflect of the specification. I read my specification, I read my test, I have understanding of what's happening. And you should really ask yourself, okay, what the answer in this situation? And write the test that is exactly this. This is my situation. This is what I'm expecting. I'm calling my code. I'm checking that it's correct. That's it. So let's take a small example. Um, consider the square root of x. Okay, fine. What would you test? I gave you a function that is computing the square root, root of a value. Uh, which kind of test cases are you thinking of? You can put the video on pause and kind of like do something on paper and then restart the video. What we can start with is actually two things, but we're going to go for what we know. For example, like, like top of my head, square root of nine, this is three. So I can leverage this. Like, oh, I need to test the square root. I don't know what to test comprehensively, like extensively, but I know that square root of nine is three. So I can take my known case and I can be like, okay, let's run this. Let's try the unit tests that actually automate the verification of this. So that's what's on the left-hand side. That's a known case. I know that in a particular situation, this is a particular result I'm looking for. We're just working, working with integer here, but that would be the same with floats. I can do another thing, which would be identify not a known case, but actually something which is a little bit bigger, which is a known probability. What I know is that if I take one number and multiply it by, by itself, I should find that number if I'm taking the square root of the product. Okay, so square root of n times n must be equals to n. And this is true each and every time. So we're not here trying to find all the tests that we need to write, because this is next lecture. This next video is really dedicated to this. What we're trying to do here is like just saying, okay, I have something to test. What would be my starting point? Okay, kind of like a walking skeleton, like, oh. I have zero tests. How can I get one for free, like low hanging fruit? Oh, square root of nine, that is three. If I take a number, multiply by itself, take the square root, I should be back to the number. Second test case. I'm not gonna write that J units here, but you got the point. Okay, you got like the gist. So concluding, um, software development is intrinsically coupled to testing. If I code, I test. If I test, I need to have the code. So it's an essential activities. And as any activities requires time and effort, and I will strengthen and emphasize the notion of essential. If you're developing code without testing, well, you have no confidence that your product is doing the right thing. You can't guarantee anything. You will see testing at very different levels. You'll do this in the testing course, of course, but also in the large-scale design course, in the HCI course, and also uh, from an acceptance point of view in the requirements engineering course. So your testing journey is just like the first step, but now you know it exists and you get the main concept like, oh, this is automatic, this is repeatable. This is not just putting the car on fire. This is getting my context, getting what I'm expecting, running my experience, running an assertion that checked that what I was expecting is actually what I obtained. And we're doing unit testing into AA4 because that's the lowest level. And the units can be a method, then a class, then the package, then the product, we're kind of like escalating like this. Then the, now we know writing tests. So the question is which test are we writing? And we've seen how to write the first one. Just start with something. You know something about your object, write the test case. It's already one and that gives you kind of like an idea of how testable is your interface. And when you have this, 
then you can apply like a reasonable engineering development methodology that will be, okay, how can we identify the test cases that we need to cover, which is the content of next lecture. That will be all for me for that video. So thank you very much for um, reaching that point after 48 minutes of me talking. And I hope uh, that everything was okay. And remember that you can ask Q&A on the Teams channel and I will be here to answer those. Thank you very much.